introduce. Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our program, Human Rights in Cuba, a community forum. My name is Helen Liu and I'm the Programming and Partnerships Manager at Cary Library. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to thank the Cary Library Foundation. Their support enables us to bring programs like tonight's event to you. This program is being recorded and will be posted to the library's YouTube channel. I just want to let you know that there will be some YouTube videos shown here, but they won't be on the recording because we won't have the rights to show it on our uh, recorded video. So there will be links that will be sent to you um, along with some of the resources and um, even the handouts for you to decide if you want to print out in the recap that's sent after the program. Um, if you have any questions, please um, raise your hand if you're here with us. And if you are on Zoom, please put your questions into the Q&A. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator. Andy Plaster has been a Lexington resident for over 25 years and is married to Anna Hebra Plaster, one of tonight's panelists. Andy has been deeply embedded in Anna's very large extended Cuban family in New Hampshire, Miami, Havana, Cuba, and Havana, Cuba, sorry. Through these relationships and his travel to Cuba, Andy has for over 30 plus years built a strong appreciation for the Cuban people, their rich culture, and the challenges of the Cuban people and their relationship with their history and the current government regime. Andy, welcome. I will now pass the program off to you to introduce our panelists this evening. Thank you, Helen. Um, so tonight's focus is on human rights in Cuba and the desire to provide a voice for the people of Cuba uh, who face a difficult struggle to achieve what we Americans would uh, just take for granted as basic human rights. In order to keep the focus on human rights, we do not intend to cover the U.S. embargo, which is a very complex uh, topic and um, uh, we it is generally can be used to deflect attention from the violation of human rights in Cuba, and uh, irrespective of what you think, it shouldn't be justifying you know any of the actions we're going to be talking about tonight against uh, Cuban citizens by the government. The format's going to have a few brief film clips uh, by two well-known not-for-profit organizations. Um, we're then going to have a brief statement by Anameli uh, Ramos Gonzalez, who is a uh, Cuban dissident who's been exiled from Cuba. Um, and hopefully she'll be able to join. We're not quite sure whether that's gonna happen or not. Following that, we'll have moderated uh, questions. We have had some questions submitted in advance and encourage the audience to ask questions. Before we start, we'd like to thank the library and the foundation uh, for hosting tonight's event and for their support, um, including telecasting this by Zoom so we can reach a broader audience than uh, we have in Lexington. Um, and then we covered that. So the first video, Helen, um, is by, uh, it's, uh, by Freedom House, which is a majority U.S. government funded organization in Washington, D.C that conducts research and advocacy on democracy, political freedom, and human rights. It was founded in 1941, uh, and its founders include Eleanor Roosevelt and Wendell Wilkie. Uh, the clip is titled SOS Cuba, Cuban 11 July Political Prisoners, and it talks about the scale and basic aspirations of ordinary brave Cubans who are speaking out for freedom. The second film clip we're going to show is by Human Rights Watch, which is an international non-government organization that conducts research and advocacy on human rights. Um, the group pressures government, governments, policymakers, companies, and individual human rights abusers to uh, denounce abuse and respect human rights. And the work and the group often works on behalf of refugees, children, migrants, and political prisoners. Uh, Human Rights Watch actually shared the Nobel Peace Prize in 1997. And the film clip is called Standing for Patria y Vida, which is Patria y Vida is Homeland and Life, which is a twist on the Cuban government's slogan, which is Homeland or Death. Thank you. 
Um, so we've got one more video. Um, I think Anna might be with Anna Melli right now. Um, so Anna Melli Ramos Gonzalez, as I said earlier, um, uh, is exiled from Cuba. Uh, she was not allowed to return. And she gave a little statement, um, which we have on video here, that is translated by Anna. <laughs> My name is Anna Ramos Gonzalez. I'm Cuban. I'm very grateful to be able to speak with you today. I find myself here in the United States for a little over a year because Cuba, my country, has refused to allow me to return. Government notified the airlines, and the airlines now refuses to let me board the plane. Obviously, this is very clearly discrimination against me because of my political activity my human rights activism. I've taught art history at the university level for 12 years, and yet my own country's embassy here in Washington refuses to speak to me about the situation or explain to me why I'm not being permitted to return home. Mine is not the only forced exile that's happening in my country. And that is because if you want to tell the reality of what's happening in Cuba, you have one of three options. One is to be imprisoned as more than 1,000 Cubans are right now, uh, including minors, teenagers, and others to just be absolutely silent. Silence yourself. And the other is to be forcibly exiled, as has happened to me for my human rights activism. All of this is supported in our constitution, which has an article that claims that the social system is irrevocable. As a result, we can't rely on laws to protect us when we have ideas that challenge the political system. That is the system outlined by the Communist Party of Cuba, the only permitted political party in Cuba. To ensure all of this, Cuba streets are highly militarized. The right to assemble, the right to protest are prohibited. When hundreds of thousands of Cubans took to the streets in July 11th, 2021, shouting liberty, they were hunted down, house to house. Some of those trials are still going on. And we're seeing the people who held a sign who shouted liberty, they're getting 10, 15 years of prison sentences, appealing to the international community so that they understand that the human and economic crisis that we are enduring in Cuba is part of a fundamental political crisis. It's an internal blockade, a way for the government to silence its people completely. Cubans want to be heard. Cuba is not the Cuban government. Cuba belongs to all Cubans. It is that government that is responsible for the massive economic failures that we endure. And it is responsible for the constant violation of its citizens' human rights. Pretty powerful stuff. Um, so we are fortunate to have Anna Melly by phone. So you probably have to hold that up to uh, the mic. Anna Melly, no puede escuchar. Anna will translate. Mm -hmm. Eh, eh, bueno, gracias por estar con nosotros. Eh, acabamos de ver el video. Eh, queríamos saber si tienes alguna, algún comentario, algún mensaje. Tenemos aquí un grupo eh, de residentes de nuestro pueblo, Lexington. Um, déjame explicarles a ellos primero lo que yo le tú estás para que ellos entiendan. So, I just asked Anna Melly si can give us just a statement, having just seen um, her video. She's been working hard to get a visa. She has no country right now. Cuba is the only um, country where she had a citizenship. She's on a bus on her way to Washington to go to the um, Organization of American States to try to petition for some help with her problem. So she's actually on a bus. It's not gonna be a perfect, um, way to communicate, but I thought it would be really great um, for her to give you uh, whatever message she's ready to give you today. Ana Mary? Sí, puedes empezar a hablar. Puedes empezar a hablar. Bueno, mucho, mucho gusto a todos. Es un placer poder hablar con ustedes, aunque, bueno, okay. las condiciones no son las mejores ahora mismo. Okay, aguanta ahí un momento. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, it's not the best of circumstances, but I'm very grateful for the opportunity. See you. Um, okay, un momentico. 
Uh, I'm in uh, I'm in um, Washington right now because a fellow artist, uh, Carlos Manuel Alvarez, was recently denied reentry into the country, and we're trying to help him. Sigue, sigue. Okay, momento. This would make him the third uh, activist that Cuba has prevented from entering the country in the last year. Myself, uh, Omara, uh, and Fiona Ruiz, uh, and um, this very well known author, actually, uh, um, Carlos Manuel Alvarez. See Okay, momento. Uh, it, it, this is a very grave situation because it appears it's going to be a new pattern and activists will be uh, prevented from returning to their home country. Uh, it's also occurring, we've just found out, to Nicaraguan activists. Okay. I uh, just wanted you to try to imagine what that is like. It's not only that we can't return to our our families and our homeland, our career, our um, um, careers, and um, it's just a strange, sur surreal situation. Sí, Ana Meli, si quieres, a ver, es, es triste porque ahora mismo los pueblos de las aerolíneas americanas están aumentando y la cosa es una manera de ver, bueno, las distintas condiciones que se pueden pasar con el ambiente, la planificación mundial. Entonces, um, it's sad because um, we're seeing an increase in flights from the United States to Cuba, and the government is saying, the American government is saying that this is a part of the reunification of families, but apparently we don't count in that uh, plan. Right. Uh, they're doing this to look like they're helping Cubans, but they're actually hurting people like us who have different ideas. Um, she did mention also that uh, um, a thawing, a new thawing of relationships is happening between the two countries that's begun, and they're left out. Okay. This is all happening during a migratory crisis where more than 200,000 Cubans have come through the southern border in the last year. Ana Meli, si quieres, eh, ya podemos más o menos terminar para poder darte a ti eh, la oportunidad de continuar con tu noche. ¿Quieres, quieres a, a, despedirte? Sí, no, sí, solo decirme que yo de eso es un poco que 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 es Okay, 
See, it's a strange arrangement because they're separating us, um, isolating us from um, uh, this thawing of relations. And they are actually deporting many of those who come here either by sea or by land, but they're forcing us to stay. Um, it's just a very sad situation for all of us. Um, We're in Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much for listening to me tonight. Can she uh, describe before she left Cuba how the Cuban government treated her and potentially her family and maybe some of the instances of uh, actions that they were taking against her? Puedes describir antes de que te forzaron al exilio ¿Qué eh, acciones tomó el régimen contra ti o contra tu familia como castigo? Bueno, lo, lo primero que hicieron fue expulsarme de la universidad, donde yo trabajaba hacía 12 años dando clases. The first thing they did was expel me from the university where I've been teaching. I have a question. Okay. Well, okay. Let her finish a little. Sigue, okay. sigue, Ana Meli. Okay. Okay, momento. When I first began uh, doing activism like Luis Manuel and Michael, and they began to uh, detain me arbitrarily wherever I was. They would just um, take me in for an, an interrogation. Uh, and then eventually they finally started putting me in cells. Is that? Okay. When this would happen, that we would be disappeared for hours or a day at a time and un unable to tell our families where we were. Okay. Uh, sometimes we wouldn't be doing anything. We'd just be walking down the street or doing a cultural event in San Isidro, which is um, the neighborhood, a very poor neighborhood where they have their uh, gallery and their art space. So it was unpredictable. Okay. Uh, uh, um, sometimes they would leave us um, in our homes and uh, with, and not allow us to leave our homes and and uh, post state security outside of our homes. Okay. Sometimes this. So, sometimes they would leave uh, us in those circumstances. Um, shut into our homes and unable to leave for weeks at a time. And there have been some activists who've been uh, held that way for six months, up to six months. Uh, Ana Meli, creo que tenemos una pregunta del público. Un momentico. Isn't she afraid of going back? Yeah. 
que si dado todo eso tienes miedo regresar Entiendo. Um, this is something that I've been asked many times, and anyone who is active in Cuba politically understands that they have to face fear, and I faced fear, and so no, I'm not afraid. <laughs> Um, bueno, Ana Meli, te dejamos entonces. Ok, buena suerte con todo. Adiós. Adiós, muchas gracias. Bueno, gracias. Ok. <laughs> so, obviously... The videos, at least I find very moving. Um, and there's you have a firsthand account of what's actually happening on the ground in Cuba. Um, for the next part of the panel the session here, we're going to have uh, our three panelists talk. So I'm going to have each of them introduce themselves and uh, give a little description of, you know, of why they're involved with Cuba and particularly their, uh, you know, their heritage. Yes, Manuel Navia. So thank you first. I don't know if you can hear me. Thank you first uh, for coming. Um, I am a uh, come from a family that's essentially economic refugees. We came to the U.S. during the Eisenhower administration when I was seven years old. And, uh, and so the total amount of ground time, if you will, that I've spent in Cuba comes, uh, clock time comes to less than a month. Uh, but I do have, I think I have a perspective of uh, the diaspora that, that I happen to be in. And, um, and I also have, um, you know, I'm, I'm in the pharma industry, so I have some, some uh, understanding of, of, uh, of that aspect of, uh, of human life. But uh, I think my colleagues are probably, I'm going to be learning more from them if you're going to learn from me. Uh, Thank you for being here, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Tom Diaz, uh, Lexington resident since 1984. I've served in town meetings since 1997, and I was on the school committee from 2004 to 2010. I also served on and co-chaired the Lexington Democratic Town Committee for most of the period from 2004 to 2015, when we moved to New Mexico for a six-year hiatus. My, my father moved to the USA in 1936 and married an American Spanish teacher. He was one of 14 children, and some of my 24 first cousins still live in Cuba. As with others on the panel, Cuba for me is not just a tourist attraction. I call myself a social democrat in tune with the social democratic parties of the UK, Germany, Scandinavia, and other Western European countries. I mentioned this to illustrate that you don't have to be a conservative to oppose the human rights record of the Cuban government. By, like, by the late 1960s, one of my uncles was sentenced to forced labor in Cuba for the crime of showing insufficient enthusiasm for Castro's government. His son-in-law, a more outspoken critic, disappeared and was never seen again. In a Marxist-Leninist state like Cuba, there's one ruling party with internal debate only among party members. And once the party makes a decision, everyone under the party's control has to obey. I first visited Cuba and met my family there in 1997. It was the first totalitarian country I had visited. On every block, there were graffiti and stickers reminding residents that they're being watched by the Committee for the Defense of the Revolution. Cousins of mine have been prosecuted in street trials for such offenses as selling clothing they have made at home. Anytime my cousins and I talk about doing something in the private sector, they would make this gesture, a sign of arrest. When I visited those cousins in Cuba, there was always a knock at the door. 
a couple of minutes after we sat down in the living room. It was the neighborhood committee member asking politely who the visitors were. A popular graffiti slogan was Siempre Contigo, Always With You, signed by the youth organization of the Communist Party. You can see how easily a system like this reverts to violent repression when any dissent takes place. Governments like this panic when there's dissent. There is no place in the society for dissent, and the party cannot tolerate it. We Cuban Americans don't all agree on what we want for Cuba in the future, but I think we all share the goal that our Cuban brothers and sisters will, can enjoy a peaceful and free life. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, my name is Anna Avena Plaster. I've lived in Lexington the same amount of time as Andy. <laughs> uh, no, yeah. Um, I came to the United States as a six year old uh, Cuban refugee with my family when um, my family's exit papers finally arrived. Um, and I have a very sharp image of that last night in our home because we were kicked out of our home. Um, and I remember the guard slapping a banner across the door and it had writing on it. I wasn't sure what it said, but many, many years later, I learned that it said property of the revolution. Our home and everything that was in our home was given to the party um, to be distributed to loyal party members. Um, my parents had originally, like many Cubans, supported the idea of the revolution because um, the idea was to get rid of, to put an end to the dictatorship of Fulgencio Batista and to restore the 1940 de democratic constitution and to revive free elections again as, the, as they had been occurring. None of that happened. The, um, their world was turned upside down. Um, politics became the center of life. Uh, they lost all the basic rights that they had always had, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, as Tom was describing, um, freedom of movement. Um, until that time, Cubans had been free to leave Cuba and return to Cuba and, and travel within Cuba without having to get permission from anybody. And after the revolution, they lost that, those rights. And those rights are uh, part of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's actually Article 13. And Anna May is another victim. But there are many, many victims like this. It happens in all directions. And an activist can be in Cuba, have bought a ticket from a state-owned airline, expensive, gets to the airport, and is told that he or she has been regulated. For what reason, they may ask, it doesn't matter, they've been regulated, they can no longer leave. So it happens in, in different ways um, and for different reasons. Um, there, it's, it's, it's complicated, uh, so you never really know how that's gonna, that particular um, loss of freedom is gonna be, is gonna manifest itself. Um, I, I remember my mother describing this new world as a world where you lived, but you were suffocating. Um, so they had applied to leave the country. Um, as soon as they applied, they lost their jobs because jobs were only for revolutionaries. They um, had to uh, replace any money that they had taken out of their bank accounts within the last, I think, five years. Um, we were working class Cubans. My father was a forklift driver. My mother was a teacher. Uh, we didn't have much of value anyway. Um, but, uh, and we had, my mother remembers it was like $73 in our only bank account, but she had to return that money. Um, and uh, we spent the next three days in, we flew, we were flown out of my, out of Cuba on one of the freedom flights, which was a Johnson administration program. I think 125,000 Cubans left during that period of time. I think they started in the 
mid 60s and ended in like 73. Um, we ended up in Nashville, New Hampshire in December. There were, there were three feet of snow. It was three feet of snow, ice. Nobody understood a word of what anybody was saying, but it ended up being a great place for us because we weren't scary for the most part, you know, to, to people because there weren't enough of us. Well, it was a big family, but it wasn't a huge community, so it wasn't threatening. It was a better time in, in this country. People were a little kinder to immigrants. And there was a, a, a strong economy. And maybe most important, we were on the right side of the Cold War. We were fleeing the same thing that the United States was fearing. Um, um, we never lost touch with our family and friends. Uh, I've traveled back twice. Um, I studied, oh, I studied the Cuban economy when I was at Smith. Um, quite a few of my professors identified themselves at the beginning of the course as Marxist or Marxist-Leninist. And they upheld, in many instances, the economy of Cuba as a model economy worthy of consideration. And when I would raise my hand, they didn't like, they didn't like seeing me raise my hand. Um, um, after a career in software, I started writing about Cuba and the Cuban, Cuban American experience, and I've been doing that ever since the last 20 years or so. Um, I've, I've had work, uh, writing published in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, uh, New York Times, and on NPR. I follow news, Cuba news very carefully. Every day I listen to two short podcasts and I check Twitter, which is a great launching pad for um, breaking news in Cuba. Um, and I am here because maybe I know too much. And maybe once you're a refugee, you're always a refugee. And you know how close you came to having lived a whole other kind of life. And I know too many of these stories that you saw and have been following so many of those cases that I actually wake up at night thinking about them, thinking about what the cells are like that they're held in, they're open latrines. Um, they're crowded, they're put in uh, cells with uh, violent criminals. These are people who never had a, a record of any kind. Um, they're fed foul food, dirty water, not given medical attention. They're beaten, they're tortured. Um, they're, they're photographed nude. In some cases, they're made to chant um, political slogans. Uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, but I don't want to take too long um, with that. I know Andy has lots of questions. Thank you. Um, so actually, before we get into some of the questions, um, can one of you explain what the 11 July protests are? Uh, I think that should set the stage for uh, some of the videos that we saw. In Cuba these days, uh, in the desert community, July 11th, 2020, one is a, a date with the significance uh, we attribute to some of our revolutionary milestones in you know, July 4th. Uh, basically, uh, much to everyone's amazement, uh, Cubans took to the streets in protest over the government's handling of the pandemic, uh, in protest over the unfair distribution of goods and wealth, uh, which are terrible in Cuba. And um, a lot of the political prisoners to whom we're referring now uh, were offenders in the government's eyes in those street demonstrations. So the government, as I said, it's easy to see, for me, it's easy to understand how a dictatorial government like this uh, violently represses its own citizens. Um, uh, and that's what, July was about. Uh, I'll just comment. I have, as I said, I still have cousins in Cuba. Even my cousins who were party members were taken aback by the treatment of the demonstrators. They're not used to that. They are not used to the repression, and they're not used to people being brave enough to speak up. Thanks, Tom. Um, 
how widespread are the protests? In other words, you know, we have videos and there are some, but you saw there were 60 cities, but maybe you can comment on uh, that this is more than just a sort of a small movement. Yeah, well, it is totally a grassroots movement. I think that the, the storyline that the regime put out was that it was orchestrated by either the Miami mafia of the Cubans or of the CIA, but clearly you don't get it. In some estimates, it was over 100,000 people. If you saw it in the, that number of cities, it's plausible. Um, but the protests continued, and, and we call it almost a whole time, 11 J or 11 July, but they continued on into, into um, uh, the 12th. And that is, I think, the date that the the only death that they claimed from all of this occurred. Um, the protests have continued in small and large ways. Um, it seems in a lot of ways that Cubans have lost their fear to some degree. Uh, and there's just more open protests. I have um, a contact in Havana who says that for the first time in all her life, she's hearing people complain openly and that's never happened in line when they're waiting in line for food or wherever. And she's really, really stunned. This fall, well, first of all, there have been power outages, rolling power out outages throughout the last six months that leave families um, across the island, that leave families without power uh, for up to 20 hours a day. So you can imagine, you can't run a fan, so your children are full of mosquito bites. Um, because you can't keep the mosquitoes off of them at night. You can't cook. People have been cooking on unopened fires. Um, so protests began in small groups in different cities. And uh, they were violently, violently put down. The human rights groups came out and tried to condemn, again, the behavior. But the government doesn't care about being condemned. It says uh, it will take to the... Um, uh, air the next day and say simply that we have never allowed and never will allow another country to interfere in our matters. And uh, that's how they dismiss it all. And, and also by blaming foreign intervention. Uh, but there have been a lot of these um, protests, even in Havana, and the videos that people have posted are hair raising. You see uh, women being beaten, and uh, these are unarmed people. You, you cannot own a gun in Cuba, and even police often don't aren't given guns. Uh, then you see military trucks uh, arriving at the scene of the protest, and dozens of beefy uh, men dressed as civilians. These are usually people in the military or serving military, doing military service, carrying clubs. They're sometimes wooden and they're sometimes metal and they use them to beat the protesters. They drag them, they throw them in the trucks and off they go. Uh, so yeah, the protests are continuing. I think one other thing which Anameli referred to is uh, the, the number of Cubans that have come over the border, southern border. I think the number last year was 220,000, which in a country of a little over 11 million is like the equivalent of six and a half million Americans leaving voluntarily to escape their government. Well, maybe six and a half million want to, but that's a different story. They're not doing it. Um, uh, so another question is, um, you know, can you describe, I mean, Ana, you've described some, so maybe for Manuel and for Tom, can you describe some of the basic human rights and that the Cuban government is denying its people? Go ahead, Tom, you can go first. Andy and I talked about this, a bit about this before we began this evening. I, I think that I would want to convey to people the, the absence of privacy there. If you think about my story, of uh, the comité member knocking on your door. That's an everyday occurrence in Cuba. And it's hard for us to, uh, to grasp what it means to have no possibility of maintaining the privacy of your associations and, and even what you say. Um, 
by the way, the cousins I was visiting are Red Hot Communist Party members, <laughs> and they were they were under surveillance. Um, everybody is, so it's just hard to grasp what it means to be in a country where I'm paraphrasing somebody else's uh, mall here, but either things are mandatory or they're illegal. <laughs> Lots of things in Cuba are illegal that you can't imagine, and there are police and spies everywhere. So it's hard to grasp, and those were the good old days before 11J. This was before people were um, protesting and being imprisoned for protesting. Um, if you were touring Havana, you might not, if you're not Cuban, you might not notice the stickers that every uh, street corner saying Committee for the CDR, Committee for the Defense of the Revolution, or Siempre Contigo. The arrests and um, imprisonment were taking place off stage. So your tour guide would not point those out to you. Um, and people learn to live with that. It's been 60 years. People have, uh, they have girlfriends, they get married, they uh, celebrate Mother's Day. Um, but there's a lot of this stuff happening off stage. Last year, it got to the point where it was intolerable. And the amazing thing to me, considering the, the complete lack of privacy, is that so many citizens were brave enough to go out in the street at all. We take for granted here that you can do that and within reason not face any repercussions, but that's never been true uh, in revolutionary Cuba. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me now? No, it's a little pause. We'll take a second. There we go. Okay. Uh, just one comment, the 200,000 people that left, of course, it's an island, and uh, not easy to get off an island, uh, for 200,000 people to get off an island and find themselves in the mainland and then attempt to cross the southern border. So it's it's not it's not an easy decision. Um, again, um, I predate all of this. I was here in, in the Eisenhower administration as a seven-year-old, so a lot of what's been said is unfamiliar. But we did emigrate, and um, and our emigration, although considerably, enormously uh, simpler than yours, uh, my father had a skill, um, and, you know, a skill that was considered uh, a necessary skill. And at that time, that's all it took. You, you, you there was actually a preference for um, um, granting visas to people in uh, in the hemisphere, in this hemisphere. So we showed up, we got our thing, and off we went. Um, Cuba at the time was a very corrupt country, and uh, and I think uh, if you've ever seen uh, a kind of an interesting little movie called Our Man in Havana, uh, if you forget the the, the theme, uh, Alec Guinness is in it. I'm a big Alec Guinness fan. If you forget if you forget the theme and just look at the background, you can see that it was it was not a not a nice place. I think that's why we left, is because it wasn't. Um, when we came, we had uh, basically uh, came in September with uh, uh, clothing that had the color of, uh, of, of winter, but uh, was much thinner. <laughs> and, uh, and it got, got very cold that year. We arrived, we timed the thing. My parents timed the, uh, our arrival in New York where we ended up so that we landed at uh, Idlewild, now Kennedy Airport, at seven in the morning. We were the first flight in, essentially. Uh, took the bus into uh, into Grand Central Terminal at the time, and my mother had remembered that one of her girlfriends lived in New York. Uh, we had a, a bag full of nickels. Uh, went to the phone book, looked at all the names, and just essentially, you know, dialed them all in, and miraculously actually found uh, her her girlfriend. The one thing, of course, that they didn't know is that New York was big enough that every borough had its own phone book. And it happened that they picked the Manhattan phone book, and this woman lived in Manhattan, and they very kindly took us in, and uh, and the rest is history. It's uh, really the American dream, uh, and I'm very fortunate to do that. With respect to rights, I think the rights that I, uh, I think we all, and certainly in this town, can afford to take for granted uh, because of where we are, um, 
the right to assembly, the right uh, for you know the free elections, and, and the right of uh, to you know to live in a place that's not corrupt. Uh, you know, there are times that I'm sure we're frustrated about some town service or other, but it's not <laughs> it's not corruption and it's not even incompetence. It's just that you know this is a complicated uh, place and and uh, and uh, and we do a good job uh, doing it. With respect to elections, my father who essentially came ahead of us to kind of scope this out. You know, is this, is this going to work? Happened to be here during the uh, presidential election that elected Dwight Eisenhower. And for the, for the rest of his life, he always used to say how different it was, uh, elections in the old Cuba, which were violent. I mean, people would, you know, people would be running around hitting people with clubs and, and so on. And he remembered that uh, that for a president, it was a presidential election, and nothing happened. Uh, <laughs> uh, of course, now, of course, we're not quite that fortunate anymore. And I think if if anything comes of this, hopefully we can you know we can mm -hmm. contemplate the fact that a lot of the rights that we take for granted in this wonderful place that we live in are actually not that uh, uh, set in concrete. We have a constitution. Uh, we think it's the kind that we believe, and I believe very strongly that it's the uh, the core of, of what we're all about. But it is it is not a um, it's a it's a delicate um, it's a delicate document. Uh, we've only been we've only had it for two hundred something years, and somewhere in the middle of that tenure, we almost lost it. We had a civil war, mm -hmm. uh, so there's no guarantees here, folks. There's just no guarantees here, and I think if uh, if you get anything out of the uh, the conversation, and again, I don't have the you know the immediate perspective that my colleagues have, um, but I, I think that's the lesson that I would yes. I would want to take back Absolutely. from this is that you know we 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 can't take for granted the good stuff that goes on in this wonderful town that we live in, in this wonderful library, in this wonderful town that we live in. Anna, did you want to add anything? course. <laughs> um, tagging on to what, uh, first of all, that was awesome. Because um, um, it does matter. It does matter, but we forget how, how fragile um, our, and how rich our, our lives are because of these uh, freedoms that we can take for granted so often. Going on what um, Tom said about um 11j it is exactly what the world that if people in the world who watched uh what was happening in cuba always said well if it's so bad why aren't people rising up why aren't people rising up it happened it happened the cost has been enormous for all of those families but a month later the world forgot about it because uh, the United States pulled out of Afghanistan and that rightly took quite a lot of uh, airtime. And then nobody really returned to the, the story. Uh, but as far as I wanted to, to just make sure that everyone understands the magnitude of what that event represents, it, it can get lost, like Tom said, because we're, we're used to seeing demonstrations here. It is not common. Uh, it's extremely rare until 11J. Um, when Andy brought up uh, lost rights, what I thought about was uh, Yoni Sanchez, who's a dissident uh, journalist, very brave, has taken a lot of uh, abuse over the years, describes the system as a political apartheid system. So if you follow the right course, live the way the party says you're supposed to live, good things happen to you. You you have wine, you have food, you are not gonna go to a filthy hospital, you're gonna go to a different kind of hospital. Um, where let's say uh, Michael Moore, was he the guy that did sicko? Uh, yeah, so that's the kind of hospital that they say they have, but that's not where average Cubans go. Um, 
you if you're if, if you don't have a clean record, you don't get to participate in free education. If your father is a an activist and you're a 13 year old, and this is happening, this is one of the stories I've been following. You can be harassed at school, pulled in as a 13 year old into an interrogation room and berated. Uh, I mean, it's it's a kind of torture, it's a psychological torture on a 13 year old. So it doesn't end with your body and your, your life, it extends to your friends and, and your um, co even co workers and, and your family. Um, the other thing that I don't think a lot of people know is, uh, I think someone referred to the right to privacy. Victim shaming is very common. It's a very common way of uh, punishing activists. So they will appear suddenly on TV and there will be an hour dedicated to that person. And they are shamed. They are accused of all kinds of crazy, disgusting things. And they lose a lot of their, even their friends, because now their friends are wondering if any of that is true. And that will be every night um, um, without a chance to uh, respond, without a chance to correct. And then the third thing I wanted to make sure everybody knew about is a pattern of public shaming called actos de repudio, acts of repudiation. You saw a man, maybe, it was a, a short frame, small frame in the first video. He's praying, he's kneeling on the ground, praying, he's bleeding, and there's a mob around him shouting. And what happens is that these um, groups uh, that are loyal to the government, uh, from either the, the, even the Federation of Cuban Women or the uh, Committees for the Defense of the Re Revolution, will organize mobs, will go to that person's house or catch them on the street, publicly shame them. Sometimes it gets violent. Uh, they'll, they'll egg their house, they'll cross into their, their property and nothing happens to them. Um, sometimes school children are pulled out of school. It's a free education, but you've got to pay for it because you've got to do what, whatever you're told to do. Um, and those students go to these events, and that's part of how they spend their education. Um, there's a story, uh, an event that happened. Remember the Patria y Vida uh, slogan, Homeland and Life? A, a young family, I can't remember where it was, they, they are activists, and they wrote Patria y Vida on the wall of their home. And uh, a mob, an acto de repudio happened. The, uh, a, a mob of people started shouting insults and then climbed over the fence and painted over over the wall. Uh, there was a dog uh, that was loose. They gave the dog some kind of pill because at first everyone thought that the dog had, had been poisoned, but the dog was just asleep. And there were children inside the house uh, screaming in this in this footage. And then I found out that their teachers were in the mob that jumped the, the fence. And sometimes you see these mobs and you see that not everybody wants to be there. You can see it in their faces, their arms are crossed. They don't want to be there. You have to be there though, because the price is so high at times. The last thing I wanted to say about a political apartheid, I uh, just read about this woman in Pinat del Rio, which is uh, where Hurricane Ian passed through. And she has three children who are in prison for having demonstrated, uh, protested during 11J. Um, she's raising, I think, seven grandchildren by herself. Her house was practically destroyed. There was water. You know, she was still walking around with water on the ground. When she saw that other people around her were getting some attention from officials, she went and asked you know, for help. And they said, you don't deserve it. Um, and that's it for her. I mean, you don't deserve it because of your your, your background and, and what's uh, and what your children are all about. So, um, sorry, I think I went on too long for that. Um, so, one one observation when we went back to Cuba, which is just was so foreign to me, is Tom alluded to the fact that there 
are uh, police on pretty much every street corner. And they're just sitting there with a walkie talkie. And what I noticed was nobody spoke to the police. They were feared. So people literally crossed the street to get away from the police, wanted no interactions with them, which I think just says a lot about the fear that the society is in. Um, uh, Anna, you beat me to the question of, you know, Cuba claims uh, a lot of success in education and medicine. And uh, I think the, you know, Anna alluded to that they're actually not, that those successes are not uh, quite what the government claims. And Manuel, do you have uh, any comments on that? Well, I, I really don't know terribly much about the day-to-day -day, uh, medicine thing. I'm, I'm in the pharmaceutical industry. I know that um, they they have um, they have a certain amount of um, of uh, uh, capacity in that area. Uh, some of that capacity uh, came about as a consequence of the um, the military expeditions that were run by the government during the war with Angola then actually ended up uh, having um, a fair number of people uh, get infected with HIV at the time. And um, part of the um, response to that, uh, one of the reasons there is a, a biotech industry of, uh, in, in Cuba um, was as a result of having to um, essentially develop domestically um, medicines, more than medicines, diagnostics for the people who were coming back uh, infected with the disease. Uh, the, um, my understanding of the, uh, the methods that was used at the time was essentially a quarantine, um, but a quarantine in an area that was essentially almost um, incarceration really. Um, um, and so it's it's a complicated issue. It's you know it's obviously a poor country, uh, and uh, and um, I guess you know it's a question of distribution. Is the distribution of the resources that that are are there uh, is it equitable? And apparently it's not. So it's 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 a story that that plays well, but it's a complicated story. It's not. It's not a straightforward story. I won't try to comment on the medical system in Cuba, but I did want to talk a moment about their literacy program. I think their literacy program, made, in my opinion, is the single successful uh, program. Uh, almost everything else Castro promised was a lie or just failed to. He failed to eliminate racism. He definitely failed to eliminate uh, corruption. Um, the Constitution of 1940, to which Mana replied, he promised to implement after the revolution. The Constitution of 1940 was their first constitution that removed the status of the United States as a protector. They were kind of a protectorate of us between 1902 and 1940. Um, so the promise of 1940 meant not only liberal democracy, but freedom from foreign intervention and foreign control, another thing he failed at. Literacy, I think, is a kind of special case in any developing society. Here in New England, in the 17th century, many of you know um, the Puritans uh, um, who, who ruled these colonies. Um, required literacy, the ability to read the scripture as a um, criterion for citizenship in, the, in Massachusetts, for example. That had the benefit later in our history of um, spreading the whole idea of public education. And so when the Industrial Revolution began in Britain, we were able to outcompete them in many ways because we had a literate class of artisans and, uh, and workers who could read blueprints and make things. Um, most other nations who were developing economically 
have realized the importance just for practical reasons like that of a literate population. And, and Cuba does have that. That's that's something they've done better than in the previous regimes. Um, the, uh, there are a couple of ironies. One of them is, if you think about the economic importance and the way Marxists think about economic importance, it's surprising to me that uh, they haven't been a more successful economic uh, power after 60 years of that. Um, the other irony is that if I think about visiting my cousins there, and again, even the most pro-revolutionary cousins are starved for things to read. They complain about having nothing to read but the Communist Party newspaper. And so I always, if you visit Cuba and, you, and you're able to take gifts to people, please take magazines and books for them to read because these are educated people, and uh, that's one of many views of the outside world that uh, are denied to them. Um, another big irony. I think, to the extent I think about hopeful thoughts about the future, um, I think it may be that for Cuba, as with the United States, there will be an unintended benefit to that educated, literate population. Um, if we we can get things in there for people to read and, and give them the freedom to read and, and uh, consider what they're reading. Uh, that will be part of the basis for a better society in the future. Okay. <laughs> a lot of problems. We have two questions. Oh, we have two yeah. questions. Why don't we do the questions? Okay. Yeah, I was going. I was about to say we got to stop. Okay. <laughs> the audience ask. Um, here. Uh, why don't you come over here for the people on Zoom and I can hand the mic, hand the mic to you. Well, this is just a comment and then I have a question. Um, it's well known in Latin America that Cuba exports their doctors because they have good doctors. And in other poor countries, they don't have that. And so they send them there and then the Cuban government gets for that. So they don't have good doctors. Uh, but my question was, uh, has how did COVID affect Cuba and the Cuban economy? Because COVID has affected negatively all of Latin America. Um, everybody's poor. So, Can I answer first? Sure. Um, COVID was a disastrous thing for the for Cuba. Um, as Manuel mentioned earlier, they have a uh, pharmaceutical industry of their own. So they, uh, it's, they didn't have access to the mRNA vaccines that were so effective here. They developed four vaccines domestically um, that were probably not too much more effective than uh, the vaccines that we would have developed in the past before the, this modern technology. So they suffered greatly from uh, uh, the effects of the pandemic. Pandemic had a disastrous secondary effect too because it completely shut off the tourist industry, which is um, one of Cuba's main sources of um, foreign exchange. So economically, it's definitely part of the disaster that led to the 11J uprising. During the occasion when we visited Cuba, uh, speaking about doctors, uh, we uh, we had actually a remarkable experience. The um, the the way these these uh, people the people type of whatever that mechanism was basically very controlled by both sides, but neither neither their side nor our side wants you to be going to Cuba at that time, wanted you to be able to go to Cuba and go to the beach or anything that was an educational experience. But within buried within that educational experience, there was half a day out of the whole time that you were there in which you were basically allowed to do stuff on your own. And uh, I wanted desperately to have my wife and my two boys see where I grew up. And so arranged with the guy at the hotel that we were staying, to find me a really reputable uh, guide who would be available for an afternoon to take us on a 
a rather tight schedule because there were a lot of places I wanted to see. And to my astonishment, the fellow that showed up was a cardiologist. <laughs> and um, he was a cardiologist and, you know, he's basically driving, you know, an Uber. Um, so there's there's a, a disconnect there. Um, uh, with respect to the the travel abroad, for example, part it's actually part of uh, as this fellow explained to us. And you know, for all I know, he may have been inventing the story, but I'm just relating it. To, I don't think he was inventing the story. Part of the of the sort of game plan of how you, as a cardiologist, get to have a, a decent life is that when you go abroad, when you're sent abroad to a country or whatever. You have the opportunity to uh, take some of the of the funding that that you're being paid, which is modest, but certainly your savings or your relative savings to buy a car, which you can then bring back legally to Cuba and sell. Um, I I think that's not a good way of 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 of, uh, of using talent. This fellow was talented. I mean he. He was up on his subject. I'm not a cardiologist, but I do work in the drug industry and I've been involved in, in working with, with drugs that, that, uh, that are involved in, in, in that area. He certainly knew his stuff. Not really a good thing for a guy like that to be driving an Uber, essentially. And uh, you know, not to say that you know, it's just that society obviously spent, made an investment in a smart person um, and that investment is being essentially squandered. I, I actually felt, you know, I, I, it was it was just a, a sense of this is a waste of, of talent. This guy should be should be doing something else rather than shepherding us around so that we could squeeze our schedule in the afternoon that we had. So it's it, again, it's complicated. It, this is not a it's, a, it's not a simple situation. I would just like to comment. Um, there have been accusations that the doctors that have been exported by Cuba are in essence slave labor, that they're not entitled, that the governments of the countries they're going to are paying the Cuban government, but that the doctors are restricted in their ability to not only earn money in the country that they're working in, but even to move around. Um, and I know that there's some, uh, I don't know, you can probably talk about, there's some uh, yeah. case of a, of a suit that's happening, I believe. Yeah. Um, there's a question over so here. So this is my question. Hold on. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. no you, you have to because the people on Zoom can't hear you otherwise. Okay, my Zoom audience. <laughs> my question is very personal. It's, you know, when I think about bad things, I shut it down. And I want to know how you personally like have this in your mind as opposed to just saying, I can't think about it. Like, how do you live in this? Yes. I don't want to think about this stuff anymore. I know. I, it, it affects me. Um, but I am really so, so, so distant from it. And um, yet it still affects me. So you heard Anna May say she's not afraid. She, she's ready to go back in there. And I don't know how people who do this kind of work, uh, human rights work, can survive knowing, maybe I have a bit too vivid of an imagination, but I really empathize with those families, in particular the women who've been left by themselves, with children, you know, um, and, and by the way, Cuba, you have to bring food to your relative in prison. Um, every 15 days, you get a habita, they bring, and hopefully that um, habita, the items in that habita get to your loved one. Uh, so the answer is, I, I try to, I, I try to think of other things. I try to say, okay, today I'm not going to do this, or I'm going to do this only until noon. Um, but after this week, I actually am going to take a break. <laughs> um, I, can, I can honestly say she says she's not going to pay attention, but she can't stop. <laughs> but I, so I, I, I did want to just say a couple of things about um, COVID. 
Um, and the status of the COVID education and uh, the status of Cuba before the revolution. Um, today, a lot of people compare um, Cuba's health system or education system, whatever, all of it, to Haiti or other developing uh, countries. But before the revolution, Cuba's economy was quite strong. In the whole history of the uh, Republic since 1903, the country never had a trade deficit. It always exported more than it imported. And that is Cuba's essential problem. They don't import, they import too much. They don't have uh, the hard currency they need to, to buy internationally. So people forget that. And, and it is essential to remember that it should be compared today with, let's say, a Mexico or a Canada even, because it, it, I believe its GDP was uh, the equivalent of Italy. It had uh, more uh, hospital beds per capita that it, it would rank like one, two, or three in all the areas of economic development in this hemisphere, as including literacy. Um, but the problem was, it was really, um, that there was a gap between the rural and the urban areas, as there are is in, in, in many uh, countries. That was one of the problems. The other problem was corruption, et cetera. But in terms of education, there were public schools, there were private schools, there were religious schools, and they were affordable for the most part because my family, working class, um, my aunt got a PhD at the University of Havana. It was like $65 a year or something quite reasonable. Um, um, and on COVID, well, actually on, on the education, when we talk about education and we use, we believe the facts and the stat, stat, statistics that come out of Cuba, there are, are big question marks because um, things don't add up all the time. And there are some reports uh, about the scores that have come out of Cuba that don't make any sense. You know, a third grader suddenly is reading, you know, the next year um, at a sixth grade level and uh, uh, it just statistically they don't make sense, and right. so there's been some. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, all right. Okay. Shoot, I want to talk about COVID, but okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, so we have one more question in the audience. We have a clip that we want to play at, play at the end, and we have questions from the Zoom people. So <laughs> let's do the quick. Let's try to keep our answers quickly, and then we'll try to get some Zoom questions in. No, uh, thank you. Uh, actually, it's a common question. Uh, I applaud you for doing this. And we should do this more in across Massachusetts. Because I consider Cuba a clear and present danger. Let me explain. Venezuela. Anyone knows Venezuela? Maduro. Maduro is in power because Cubans, agents, are there advising. Nicaragua. Who knows Nicaragua? Right? You mentioned 220,000 Cubans have left. 200,000. 200, I'm Cuban, by the way. 1960s. Which I was. Yeah, never come back. <laughs> I won't take money over there. But anyhow, Nicaragua. Right now, I have my my wife has two nep uh, two nephews, grand nephews, doing the trek from Nicaragua. We sent twenty thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars each, for them to do that trek and come to the southern border and come in present to the authorities, and they're protected by the U.S. law. $20,000. $7,000 of that is the air airfare, which is probably with the most expensive. From Havana to Managua, $7,000 per $14,000. And that money goes The clear and present danger that I would like to address is that in Boston City Council, 
we're we're going to try to stay out of politics. Sorry. <laughs> I invite you. And I invite you to come to Newton, where I live, to do this. See, you Sandra. We in? Manuel? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We're in. We're in. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we have some Zoom questions or a, a Zoom question. Okay. Uh, so the first question is what practical steps can we take in Lexington that would be helpful? We will at the end of the session, um, there's some handouts here for people in person. Uh, in the recording, um, there will be these handouts will be included in the recording um, in the recap. Um, uh, we're going to try to stay out of politics. Uh, uh, going down. But because their politics are, is a judgment, right? There are different values that people have and maybe different priorities, but I don't think human rights are a value judgment. Right. That's what we're. That's why we're trying not to talk about the embargo. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, that's politics. We're not going to go there. Okay. So I think we, we said we we're going to try to end at eight thirty. It's eight twenty six. We have a four minute video, so we're going to play the last video. And uh, um, want to thank again uh, the the library for hosting. And uh, appreciate everybody here. We'll be around for a little bit. I know the library is going to close. Uh, you know, they're going to kick us out in not too long, but. Can you give me a minute? Yeah. Uh, okay, one, uh, one minute. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about politics, but I'm going to start to say I'm reporting. No, no, no. I'm in the pen. Um, I heard a lot of things about you, and then I know it exact. Um, I'm 81 years old. I'm born in 1941. Um, my dream, I came from a very poor family. My mother was washing clothes for the neighbors around my house. My father was a bus driver. And my dream was to be an architect, to build a house for my mother. So when I went to, to the Havana University and I went to the architecture uh, faculty, uh, they, they, they won't let me. They say, no, we need a veronist. We don't need any more architecture. We don't need any more uh, whatever. So, well, I want to be a civil engineer because they're related career. Say, no, we need a veronist. And I said, okay, I'll come back some more today. And I left. Then, about six months after, they opened up the, uh, the architecture um, uh, faculty on the civil engineer. I was so happy, I went back to them and I said, well, I want to be an architect. So, oh, you're fine. I remember you, you came in about six months ago. Yes, I did. Okay, <laughs> okay no problem. We need an uh, architect now. I said, okay, I want to be an architect. Say, well, do you have the Communist Party ID? Say, no. Well, you cannot come to the, to the university. They won't let me because I was not a communist at that time. That's talking about a little bit of education. About the literacy campaign in Cuba, I was there because I couldn't take uh, and be what I wanted. I took surveying and topography. So I was specializing in a mind to board. So when that big campaign about literacy went on, I was there. I was there. They sent uh, the, the um, middle school kids to teach the patient, the, the, the campesino, whatever. And uh, they used to give them a, a diploma, a diploma certificate of being um, uh, no more literate. You know what they require from them? To write down, arriba Fidel, fuera el imperialismo yaqui. You know, that's all that they, they required for them to, to, to write, but they were not literate. That was a big campaign. Yeah. So I was a witness of that. 
Thank you, Audrey. Gracias, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you guys translate what he did with the the last thing? Oh, the last <laughs> thing. Sorry. <laughs> no, uh, so um, I believe in Fide. Oh, I believe in Fide. You know, onward Fide. And yeah, um, get down imperialism out of here. and out with imper uh, imperialism. So, US, 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 um, okay, so with that, uh, we're going to play this last film clip. We'll be available. Oops. Just that the two of the two of the artists in featured in this video. One of them wrote the wrote the song, helped write the song. Are in prison. They've been um, they're activists. They're friends of Anamese. She mentioned them. Uh, Luis Manuel de Alcanta and Michael uh, Castillo Sorbo uh, is a, a rapper, and they are uh, verified Amnesty International prisoners of conscience. They're in maximum security prisons. Denied. I think you got the picture, but I just wanted to let you know that. And also, this song won last year um, the Latin Grammy Song of the Year and the uh, Best Urban Song. I just won. Thank you.